Okay, let's start. Uh, hey everyone, hope you had a nice holiday weekend. Uh, I have the great pleasure of introducing Professor John Jack Slotin as today's speaker. Uh, Dr. John Jack Slotin is Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Information Sciences, Professor of Brain and Cognitive Sciences, and Director of the Nonlinear System Lab at MIT. He received his PhD from MIT in 1983 at age 23. After working at Bell Lab in the Computer Research Department, he joined the MIT faculty in 1984. His research focuses on developing rigorous but practical tools for nonlinear systems analysis and control. This have included key advances and experimental demonstrations in the contexts of sliding control, adaptive nonlinear control, adaptive robotics, machine learning, and contraction analysis of nonlinear dynamical systems. Professor Slotin is the co-author uh, co of two graduate textbooks, Robot Analysis and Control and Applied Nonlinear Control, which is one of the most cited books in system science and robotics. He was a member of the French National Science Council from 1997 to, 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 to 2002 and of Singapore's A-star SIGN Adversary Board from 2007 to, uh, to 2010. He currently is a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Italian Institute of Technology and a distinguished visiting faculty at the Google Brain. He is a recipient of the 2016 Oldenburg Award. Okay, please join me in welcoming Professor Jean Jacques Slotin. Jean Jacques, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Very good. Well, thank you very much for inviting me and th thank you very much for organizing this uh, great series of talks. I very much enjoyed the, all the previous ones. And I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a silver lining of COVID that uh, we can have these, uh, these uh, international uh, talks, you know. So, um, if, uh, yeah, so I'd like to talk about uh, some, uh, some work, some of which uh, are old and some of which much more recent, actually, a lot of what I'll talk in this talk is like 2020 papers. Um, so about contraction analysis and optimization and learning. Uh, if I can. So the, you know, we have these kind of standard uh, numbers about the brain, 100 billion neurons and uh, about uh, 10,000 uh, connections per neurons, right? Uh, which means that you have about 10 to the 15 connections. So that means a lot of things. So uh, first of all, if you do a little calculation, it means that uh, from the time a baby is born to the time she goes to college, these 10 to the 15 connections have to be uh, created. And so if you just divide this by 18 or 20 years, you find it's about a million new connections per second. Okay. So you need to create these million new connections per second, which you know, if you see it as a big dynamic system, as a big feedback, a control system is a non-obvious thing. You know, you have these, uh, you know, these uh, millions of feedback loops, basically, all these millions of connections being created per second. The other thing it implies is that there's probably extreme over-parameterization, okay? Because in a sense, you're creating these 10, you have this million new connections per second, and actually much more than that, because we know there's extensive pruning, so maybe 10 times more than that, 100 times more than that, okay? Uh, so where, where do you get uh, the information to create them all, right? These uh, 100 million uh, new connections per second. You know, we, we, kind, of, uh, we kind of move at uh, 10 hertz and, and we think around 50 to 100 hertz, right? So uh, why create uh, 100 million new connections per second? Okay, so it's, it's, it's very much points towards uh, over-parameterization. Um, so the uh, other thing is... Um, Let's see if I can move this thing correctly. Uh, is that this other number, right? Uh, it's, uh, you know, the neurons are 10 million times slower than transistors. Uh, so if, um, so it means that, uh, you know, we're doing all these great things like uh, playing basketball and so on uh, with hardware, which is 10 million times slower than current electronic hardware. Uh, so, um, this, uh, you know, so it, it says, you know, there's probably still a lot to learn, uh, from the brain in terms of building, uh, more, uh, more engineered systems, because we, we're doing these real time things with desperately store hardware, right? Humans are doing this with desperately store hardware. Okay. 
another uh, another suggestion why it's uh, another suggestion why it's there's probably still a lot to learn from the brain is that if you compare uh, what the, our best engineered system now to the brain, right? Uh, you need in principle, at least if, if you start from scratch, millions of examples to distinguish, to do classifications, for instance, while you know a child would need only two or three examples to make the difference between a, a cat and a dog, for instance. Uh, and similarly, you need close proximity to uh, electrical power dams you know, to do all these calculations uh, while the brain is doing all of this uh, with 20 watts. Okay? So we are at a point where you know, there's a lot of promise in machine learning. At the same time, you know, uh, it's, uh, we, we're very, very far away from the brain, especially if we uh, count this very slow hardware that the brain has. And in a sense, it's very, uh, that's what makes it particularly interesting. Just to mention, if, if uh, people who are around can turn on their videos, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, I can, I can see at least if people have questions or uh, are puzzled or something like that. Uh, so, um, so another kind of general principle, of course, about building brains is that the brain is the result of evolution. Okay, so you see it in, uh, in, uh, you send, you see it in, uh, in you know, for instance, uh, all sort of responses, which are the sum of uh, uh, all the evolutionary, they're all responses with much faster, uh, much faster learned uh, responses. You have the same thing in immunity, where you have this piling up of sub blocks, which is the result of evolution, and all the blocks work together, you know, innate immunity and adaptive immunity, which is, of course, the basis of vaccination. You know that in uh, in frogs, uh, you have uh, motor primitives, uh, so the, the motions of a frog leg uh, depend only on a few motor primitives. Uh, second aspect that the brain is very good at is prediction, and we'll talk a lot about prediction in this talk, okay, whether you're trying to catch a ball or cross the street differently in Boston and London, uh, preparing your body to wake up. Uh, all of conditioning is based on prediction. The placebo effect is based on prediction, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, uh, uh, 50, uh, uh, 42% uh, of the time, uh, you know, taking a sugar pill is just as effective as taking something which is uh, really uh, supposed to be uh, active. You don't have time to go talk about Wagner operas, uh, but I'll be happy to answer questions. And illusions also are the reflection of predictions, you know, for instance, this classical illusion by Ted Adelson, right, where it obviously have, uh, you, see, you can see the arrow, right? You obviously have a, a gray square and a white square, except of course the squares are exactly the same. But it's just our brain is interpreting this entire scene, and it's a feature, right? Because that's what the brain is supposed to be good at. It's supposed to be good at interpreting scenes. Okay. So um, now let's see. And synchronization is a third kind of key principle that the brain is using. So. The outline of this talk is uh, going to start with basic contraction analysis. Okay, so why contraction analysis? Because uh, it turns out to be uh, something uh, which is comparatively simple to or simpler to, to handle a lot of nonlinear control and estimation problems. And in particular, it's very good at Lego. Okay, so it's, it's very good at taking blocks which are contracting and combining them so as to get more complicated things which are contracting, okay? And if you think of it in machine learning and so on, we're just at the beginning of that, of putting blocks together. You know, if you take something like uh, alpha zero, it's putting like a few blocks together, right? Uh, so we're just at the beginning of this, okay? And so this modularity aspect, which is very much the result of evolution in the brain is, is something we're just starting to address and, and contraction is a very natural tool for that, okay? Second point is, is uh, the fact that most elementary result which on gradient descent that we have, where we think about convexity uh, can be replaced by much more general results based on contraction, okay? So in other words, the kind of the reflex of saying, well, it's going to be really easy if it's convex. No, actually it's going to be really easy if it's contracting, which is a much more general result, okay? Um, two, uh, we'll talk about adaptive prediction and control, mostly adaptive prediction, okay? And if you think of it, right, stable concurrent learning and control of dynamical system is the subject of what used to be called adaptive nonlinear control, okay? Uh, so now it's, you know, if you, if you say that, it's, oh, well, reinforcement learning, but actually stable concurrent learning and control of dynamical system is adaptive nonlinear control. So we'll try to relate it to, to these, uh, these ideas and, uh, 
And then, by the way, you know, st all these four points are 2020 papers. Okay, the first, the first is uh, much older. Um, this f the, the fourth point is that we'll, we'll be talking about uh, implicit regularization. Okay, and in particular, you know, how can you get these uh, these adaptive uh, predictors uh, to uh, regularize uh, the parameters? Okay, over parameters, uh, over parameterized systems. And uh, we, we'll see that you can you can build on early results on implicit regularization to to do things very simply. Uh, one aspect of that will be model discovery. So, in other words, if you have a physical system and you have lots and uh, you know it, the things depend on the potential, but you're not sure if the potential is one over r, one over r square, one over r cube, right? You can use uh, this implicit regularization if you pick an L1 norm to pick the relevant basis functions. Okay. And so that's what we'll uh, that's what we'll do as well. And finally, we'll talk. Uh, and also, yes, yeah, so, uh, forget about that. And you know, in the in the spirit of this seminar, uh, we've also recently uh, derived results which try to put all of these ideas very much uh, in the vocabulary of current reinforcement learning res research in terms of regret and things like that, which you know we've talked we've heard about in previous talk by uh, by. Uh, uh, Elad Azan and uh, Dada Kassi. And finally, we'll talk about transfer learning. Uh, and uh, the notion is, you know, you have these banks of robots or you've done extensive simulation to do something really complicated with a robot. And so, and so now this is somebody says, wait a minute, actually, uh, I need a backpack on this robot. Okay, or well, the mass properties of the links have changed. You know, do you need to relearn everything? And you know, the, the, often in machine learning, they tell you, well, you know, you want to be robust to to these variations, but that's uh, that's not a good answer. You know, if you take something like uh, Amazon Robotics, you know, it works on adaptive control. You know, it doesn't work on being robust; it works on being adaptive. Okay, uh, and so we'll we'll see how uh, how you can uh, put uh, put together uh, ideas from uh, you know something you've carefully already learned and then structured uh, structured. Um, uh, adaptation to variations and parameters. So let's start with basic contraction analysis. Okay, so this is something uh, uh, we uh, we developed with uh, uh, a particular real, particularly brilliant student I had uh, years ago named uh, Winnie Lomiller. And uh, Winnie was really good at everything, but uh, one of the things he was really good at is fluids. Okay, and so we started wondering whether uh, we started wondering whether uh, one could, instead of Lyapunov theory, which is a sort of virtual mechanics, okay, we could, whether we could build some sort of virtual fluids, okay, and that's why that took us to, to contraction analysis, and, and so, um, at least that's where we came uh, towards that. Uh, and uh, so basically, if you have a nonlinear system, X is the state, and we say that the system is contracting, if any two solutions converge exponentially, uh, and uh, the, the main uh, theorems is that this is true if and only if the, the Jacobian of the system, so the linearization of the system everywhere, is negative definite, but in some metric, okay? So in a sense, it's like Riemann coming to the rescue of Lyapunov, right? Uh, you're building your analysis on linearization, but not linearization at the point, linearization everywhere, okay? And of course, linearization everywhere is basically almost the same thing as knowing the entire function. Right? If you know the function somewhere and the linearization everywhere, then you'll you know the entire function. So you base your analysis on linearization everywhere. And if the Jacobian the linearization is linear, negative definite in some metric, and we'll, we'll come back to that, uh, then uh, the system is uh, contracting and any two solutions will converge exponentially. Um, so, for instance, to, to, to give you an example, you know, suppose you have a Lorentz attractor, which is definitely not a contracting system. You're trying to build an observer for it, so something which predicts y and y hat. You're very lazy, so you just copy the dynamics of y and z by putting hats on them and use the measurement x. Okay, so this is your observer. If you take the Jacobian of your observer, it's equal to this, right? Depends on x. And therefore, it's obviously negative definite, okay? So, and because you were so lazy, the uh, real system is a particular solution of the observer, okay? Therefore, this one line of calculation shows that this observer for this chaotic system will globally exponentially converge to the real y and z, 
with a rate which is the smallest of one in beta. Okay, this is the entire proof. Okay. Uh, and so it's just saying that the, the observer is contracting in an identity metric. Uh, you don't have to take a metric here, and the uh, and the real system is a particular solution. So as advertised, uh, if you uh, contracting system have Lego-like properties. So basically, under very simple conditions, you can take parallel combinations of uh, uh, contracting system, negative feedback combinations, series and cascades, translate and scaling uh, in, in space and time, and combination of all of the above. And you can progressively build very, very, very big contracting systems out of contracting subblocks. Okay. And at the time we said, well, you know, we suspect that, you know, something that uh, nature probably does, you know, having a kind of contraction properties in, in, uh, in building blocks uh, uh, at a certain scale. And this is actually, although we, we certainly didn't, didn't invent the term, this kind of behavior was uh, later called evolvability. Okay. Uh, so that's something you, you see a lot now in biology, you know, so, so things, things that, uh, that, help, uh, that help evolution, if you want by uh but that help evolution by uh basically uh creating structures which like to play lego with each other okay which like to be built on top of each other so so for for uh, for people who know about this composite variables can be seen as creating uh, contractions of uh, sliding variables can be seen as creating contraction of uh, uh, hy hierarchies contracting systems uh, if you, you can use these parallel combinations, for instance, to look at control primitives in robotics, uh, you can show that if you have a contracting system, which is driven by a periodic, uh, vector, then the state will converge, ex converge exponentially to periodic state. Uh, you can take networks of contracting system, replace them using a standard CS algorithm into directed acyclic graphs of strongly connected components. In other words, hierarchies, and because of the hierarchical properties of uh, combinations contracting system using any metrics, then uh, if the trend is now this transform, if the blocks in this transform system, equivalent system are contracting, then uh, each of the uh, the original graph will. Be. Can look at time delays too, but I don't think I have time to talk about. And you can pick alternate norms too. So instead of uh, instead of looking at the Jacobian being negative definite, you can give uh, alternate uh, equivalent conditions for uh, with the existence of a metric, uh, which have to do more with diagonal dominance. So let's come back to that, right? So let's be a little more specific. So with a metric of the form theta transpose theta, where theta is a function of state and time. The condition that the Jacobian expressed in this transformed, uh, in this Riemannian, the field, the Riemannian Jacobian is negative definite, can equivalently written as this condition, which rem which kind of remind uh, reminds of the uh, uh, Lyapunov matrix equation. It is have an n dot, and it has a, a uh, an exponential convergence term. Right? So the system uh, system is contracting with respect to this metric, which depends on x and t. Uh, if uh, m dot plus a transpose m plus m a is less than minus two alpha m, where alpha is a posit strictly positive number and uh, m is the metric. And this shows, what, so as we said, what does it mean It's contracting? It means that any two trajectories will tend exponentially to each other, okay? More technically, it means that if you take the geodesic distance between any two trajectory, the geodesic distance at time t, the Riemannian distance, right, would be less than what it was at time t equals zero times e to the minus alpha t. Okay. So that's the that's the basic if you want, result. And you have a robustness version of this, okay, which is going to be very useful when later on we talk about adaptive control and, and, and so on, which is if you have a nominal system and you have a perturbed system with a disturbance, okay. If you look at, if you wonder how far away are, is the trajectory from the perturbed system from the nominal system, you can show that the geodesic distance between these two states verifies the same equation you would have just for a purely contracting system, okay? But then you have an extra term, which is due to the disturbance, okay? And this is an instantaneous bound, okay? So instead of having d over dt of dm less than lambda dm, now you have the d over dt of dm less than lambda plus 
normal theta d. This has two immediate but important implications. First of all, is theta d tends to zero, which is going to be typical of adaptive control or adaptive prediction. Then, of course, you have a filter driven by something that tends to zero. So uh, xp, the perturbed term, will tend towards x. All right, so that will be the first thing. If theta t tends to zero, xp will tend towards x. Two, if the signal is L2, this will also be the case, okay? Because again, you have a low, basically a, a filter, okay? So if you, uh, so that's going to be very important when we talk, uh, when we talk about adaptive control. So the, so remember we had these aggregation properties, okay? Uh, which were plausibly favored by evolution. If we now look uh, here, we'll see that also we have adaptation. So in other words, if you take these nominal contracting systems, put them together Lego-like using these aggregation properties, and then say, wait a minute, these are just nominal system. Each of them needs to do work on adapting its parameters. Okay. Then you're going to have exactly this structure, right? Where each of them is going to be driven by something that tends to zero. And therefore, you will also have basically that the entire system would tend to the nominal behavior, okay? So you can combine these combination properties, you can put together these aggregation properties with a local adaptation to get the entire system uh, to, to converge to what it should be, okay? And, and therefore you can use all these uh, properties. Okay, so first uh, so first kind of new thing okay uh, how to suppose we we try to look the look at these tools but apply them to gradient descent okay so obviously if you just have a gradient descent okay uh, and you look at the Jacobian of the system you find a Hessian okay so this the system is contracting in an identity metric uh, if and only if, the, the Hessian is uniformly positive definite, larger than alpha i, and so if and only if alpha is strongly convex. So alpha strongly convex says that the system is contracting in the identity metric, and one can show in autonomous system, if you have a contracting system, it tends towards a unique equilibrium. But of course, if you have a system, it could be contracting in any metric, and it would still be true that it converges to unique equilibrium, okay? So convexity is a very, very, it's a, it's a set of zero measure in all the things that tend towards a unique equilibrium, okay, corresponding to identity metric. But actually, as long as it's contracting any metric, it converges to an equilibrium. Okay? So similarly, if you have a, a natural uh, gradient, okay, you can show that natural gradient is automatically contracting in the metric of the natural gradient if the function is convex with respect to this metric, okay? So it's an extension of the previous result. So the, the natural gradient is contracting in the natural metric if the function is convex in this metric. But again, to tend towards a unique equilibrium, it doesn't need to be contracting in that metric. It could actually be contracting in anything you want, in any metric you want. The technical result is that basically, if you look at this quantity, which defines contraction, and you apply it to the natural metric, then you get exactly the geodesic Hessian. Uh, so you have this very simple relation, if you want, between contraction and natural metric and the geodesic Hessian. Uh, okay, so, and this, this relation works also for time varying systems. Okay, so in other words, this is, this is an algebraic relation, so everything could depend on T. And what does this allow you to do? It allows you to put systems together. So for instance, you could have hierarchies of natural gradient. And if, uh, if you use a combination property of contracting system, then this is going to be contracting, assuming that F1 is strictly convex and F2 is strong, strongly G convex, but more generally that this is contracting in some metric and this is contracting in some other metric. So what is hierarchical natural gradient? It's backdrop, okay, that's backdrop. Uh, so similarly, if you put them in feedback, then you have basically multiplayer games, okay? Uh, which, uh, which you find in adversarial learning and all sorts of uh, other things, primal dual, and we'll, we'll come back to it. So in other words, you can, because of this result, you can take the, the, the combination properties of contracting systems and use them to apply to these kinds of problems. 
So suppose we now look at semi-contraction. Okay, so semi-contraction says that basically this condition here, sorry, this condition here would be true for alpha equals zero. Okay, so the Jacobian is negative semi, the, the generalized Jacobian is negative semi-definite. So suppose we now look at semi-contraction for a natural gradient. We could also take an equal identity, then it would be just a gradient. You can show that if the, that system is con semi-contracting in some metric, okay? So it's not contracting in all directions, it's just semi-contracting. Then all trajectories tend towards a global minimum of V and all, the, the, all these global minima are path connected. All right, so if you have a system like this, which is semi-contracting, it has exactly the same topology that you find in deep learning, right? So things basically converging, well, exactly. It has a topology extremely reminiscent of what you find in deep learning, where basically you tend towards global minima, very good minima, right? And also between these points, you have solutions, okay? So uh, uh, if you have a system like this, it's semi-contracting in some metric, then it always takes to, tends towards a global minimum of Z, uh, and all global minima are path connected. So for instance, if you take this cost function and this natural gradient with respect to this natural metric, you specify this, okay, this is just a toy example. You're going to get this kind of result, which kind of tends towards this valley, okay? And this system is not sem contracting or semi-contracting in an identity metric, but it's semi-contracting in this metric, okay? So, uh, so you, you have this behavior of things tending to valleys and so on. This is a natural gradient with a certain metric theta transpose theta and which is semi-contracting with yet another metric. So it says immediately that if you have a, an autonomous system and a scalar cost function, if you can combine this with the kind of ideas, if you want, okay. So it says immediately that if you have a, a scalar cost function for an autonomous contracting system, then all trajectory tends toward a global minimum of this cost function. But it also gives you a, a sort of invariant set theorem. If you have an autonomous semi-contracting system and you have a scalar function such that V dot less or equal to zero, suppose you have an invariant set, not necessarily the largest, where V dot equals zero and contraction holds on this invariant set, then all trajectories tend towards a unique equilibrium, which is on this invariant set and which is a global minimum, okay? So you have a kind of a, a result on global uh, uh, um, minimization with a semi-contracting system, which is the, you know, a sort of invariant set theorem uh, adding some contraction. Okay, so that's why we call it contraction plus. Also, if you take an autonomous semi-contracting system, uh, gradient system, and you look at a particular equilibrium and you have the idea of linearizing and you find the linearization is strictly stable, but actually you show this is the only equilibrium. There's no other equilibrium. If the linearization is strictly stable at a point, then they all tend towards that point. And you can extend this to primal dual, uh, to primal dual uh, optimization. Uh, basically you have this very simple result that if you take this primal dual system with metric, okay, so a geodesic primal dual that we would find uh, again in uh, adversarial learning and, um, and so on, then uh, you, uh, you, get, uh, you get this uh, result. What you're looking for is basically directly dependent on what you had before. So you get, get immediately the fact that if they're individually contracting with respect to their natural metric, then the primal dual will be contracting as well. And so, so f before we had the, you know, um, uh, feedback combination of strictly contracting systems, if you now look at the corresponding to, let's say, multiplayer game, suppose that you now look at the feedback combination of a contracting system with a semi-contracting system, then you have exactly, we have something which is very similar to what you have in reinforcement learning, but it's also very similar to adaptive control, okay? So in adaptive control, there's this notion of a learning on a need to know basis, okay? In other words, when you learn a control system with unknown parameters, you learn just enough about the parameters to do the, to do the task, okay? Uh, because if the task is very boring, there's no reason that you learn all the parameters exactly, and that's a feature. 
And that's something that you will have also uh, in any of these structures of contracting with semi-contracting, and therefore in some of these instances of reinforcement learning. Is there, uh, running a little late, is there one quick question? Otherwise I can move on to the, the adaptation. Maybe I'll move on to the adaptation. Okay. But that's a very quick question from yeah. our YouTube audience. I'm, I'm sure you, 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 you heard this question very frequently. Like, could you summarize the difference between like uh, contraction analysis and the Apnov's uh, direct method and the Apnov. Uh, yeah, can, can you give me an hour? Uh, yeah, so uh, so ba basically, you know, contraction has to do with uh, convert uh, basically incremental stability. You know, uh, having uh, you know what happens with two trajectories uh, starting away from each other and exponentially converging. Okay, uh, it's particularly suitable for non-autonomous systems, and it does not require to know a nominal behavior okay uh, and therefore you can say whether the system is contracting or not whether any trajectory tend toward each other and say by the way uh, the real trajectory uh, is a particular solution therefore everybody tends towards the real trajectory but you don't need to build a function like in the Japanese function with the difference to a nominal behavior okay so you can separate if you want stability from what it converges to okay but of course i could give a much uh, longer answer but also as i said from a from a flavor point of view, you know, it's still Lyapunov's idea, Lyapunov's idea of virtual physics, okay? It's still the idea of some kind of virtual physics, except Lyapunov is really kind of virtual classical mechanics and contraction is more virtual classical fluids. Okay, so let's talk a little about prediction, okay? So suppose that, so this is, uh, this is work with, uh, so but sorry, I forgot to mention that all of this previous work uh, on uh, on optimization is uh, is uh, is sorry is uh, is work with uh, Patrick Winsing and uh, just came out uh, in plus. Okay, so uh, adaptive prediction. Uh, so this uh, yeah. So this is work with uh, these two are uh, work with uh, Nick Bofi and uh, towards the end uh, also with Stephen too, and uh, transfer learning will be work uh, with many people and in particular Brett Lopez. Uh, so, uh, adaptive prediction. So, suppose that we have a, a system like this, and we'd like to learn a predictor, okay? So, in other words, we'd like to learn a dynamic system, which learns just enough about the parameters so that after a while you can turn off the learning and run the system open loop, okay? And presumably it will be able to do what the system is supposed to do for a while, okay? So, suppose you do this, okay? So the, the, the structure could be that the predictor state is equal to y times estimates of the parameters plus uh, an error signal. So here we have a full predictor. We assume full state feedback. You can have uh, you know, later version observer-like versions. But here we just measure everything, but we just want to create the right alphas. Okay? And so we create the right alphas by an adaptation or learning rule, okay, which has some gain, some basis functions here. Uh, and the prediction error. Okay. So if we do this, then you can show that this particular learning rule will make x hat tends to x if f plus g is contracting in a constant metric f. Okay. So uh, f plus g, what is f is, is this dynamics, right? Um, y a and g is this kind of feedback. So if f plus g is contracting in this constant metric, then uh, you x hat will tend towards x. So, uh, so in other words, after a while, you'll have learned the parameters well enough so that your uh, simulation of the system is tending towards the right thing. Okay? And so you can show this uh, using this, uh, this function and you'll find immediately a Lyapun, uh, sorry, um, the contraction-like condition involving the Jacobian of f plus g with respect to a metric. Okay, and here it's a constant metric, but you could also uh, do it for um, for uh, a state-dependent metric uh, using tools developed by by Brett Lopez. So once we have this, and you could do similar things for adaptive control. Uh, once you have this, you could uh, wonder: Okay, can we use the recent results? On implicit regularization, for instance, the results of Navida Zizan and, and others, uh, to fine tune our uh, adaptive controller 
to regularize the parameters. Okay, so that could be when the trajectory is kind of boring, and so the system is overparameterized because the trajectory is boring, so there's not enough information. Okay. Or it could be because the, the system is overparameterized because you made sure it was overparameterized because you were thinking of you know, uh, machine learning or you were thinking of these uh, hundreds of millions of new connections you have to create in the brain every second. So how can we do implicit regularization you know, for an overparameterized system, overparameterized either, be before, because of, uh, either because of um, uh, lack of uh, richness of the desired task uh, or um, oh, explicit uh, aggressive parameterization. Yeah. And there's lots of ways to regularization, but one which is particularly interesting is model discovery. So in other words, if you do a sparse regularization, it means you can start with tons of basis functions, you know, maybe physical basis functions, but you're not sure if the potential is one over R, or one over R square or something else, okay? And then because you're doing sparse adaptation, pick the relevant ones, okay? So let's uh, see this. So if you want to, you know, uh, one of the ideas of sparse uh, regularization is, is this idea of uh, Feynman that you can see in the, uh, in the Feynman lectures on physics, you know, which is that, uh, you know, you, in these basic physics equation, you always find gradients and divergences and stuff like this, right? And there's very good reasons for that, okay? Uh, uh, the important things that will be involved would be the rates of change of quantities with respect to positions. And the derivatives uh, must be expressible in vector form because the laws of physics are independent of direction, and therefore you have to need, you need to have somewhere gradients or divergent or divergence, okay, all the Laplacians. So uh, so there's this notion that you know uh, the sparsity can be used to 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 uh, to basically pick the, the relevant basis functions. So. Um, so basically, the the uh, the idea is you know which. Uh, was inspired by Tai Yun Li's beautiful work on imposing LMI constraints in adaptive robot control is that if you if you have a, a, a Lyapunov slash contraction based uh, design of uh, adaptation, normally you have a quadratic error here between the actual and the desired parameters. But actually, this uh, quadratic error uh, could be replaced by a Bregman divergence. Okay, more generally. Okay. With respect to a to a convex potential function, and if the potential function is quadratic, you just get the usual quadratic thing. But otherwise, you get something more general. And if you do this, you'll find out that basically the algebra is exactly the same as before. But instead of having this p matrix used to be constant here, now it has been replaced by this Bregman divergence. And instead of p inverse, you're going to get this Hessian of the potential. And because you get the Hessian of the potential, uh, then you're going to, uh, it's going to be very easy to implement. Okay, remember if you if you pick this uh, L1 plus epsilon norm or so, this Hessian is of course diagonal, right? So it's inverse is very easy uh, if you pick norms, right? Uh, and so if this is going to be very easy to implement, but you can show that I don't think we have time to, to show this. I'll be happy to answer questions about this, okay? But you can show that if you do that, okay, not only you stably converge to the actual trajectory and all these good things, but also in the state of all the parameters, this is an overparameterized problem, right? In the state of all the parameters that would have achieved the task, you tend towards the one that minimizes the potential, okay? So it's a very simple change, just replacing a constant matrix here by the inverse Hessian of the potential of a norm, and you automatically minimize that norm. Okay, in the overparameterized case. Okay, in the in the uh, exact uh, leap, uh, you know, in, in the, in the uh, minimally parameterized case for an exciting trajectory, you tend towards one set of parameters. But in the overparameterized case, that's the regularization you get. You automatically minimize a cost. And so I'll skip the, the proof. I'll be happy to answer questions. Okay. Uh, so, so, for instance, you know, uh, in uh, you're going to get, uh, uh, you know, with L1 kind of regularization in adaptive control, you're going to get tons of parameters uh, which are zero and only a few which are relevant. Okay. In L2 parameterization, uh, you're going to get a Gaussian like uh, distribution. And in L infinity or L10, you're going to take more like a uh, bimodal distribution. 
and uh, so, and um, so, and as I said, you know, this is uh, this is basically using uh, in the context of these continuous time closed loop stable adaptive control ideas from implicit regularization, for instance, from uh, Navida Zizan and others. So um, and and showing you know explicitly why this this can be done stable. So. You can do this for observer design as well, and maybe I'll pass on this. But you get you get uh, again, uh, you know, uh, a contracting a contraction condition. Okay, for this to work. Okay, so you can do this, for instance, for mechanical system or systems, you know, with uh, with having Hamiltonian, where uh, you um, learn directly the Hamiltonian. Okay, and so for instance. Uh, uh, Botu had done work on learning Hamiltonian offline using deep networks and many trajectories. Okay, so here we learn Hamiltonians directly in the Hamiltonian system uh, using uh, for adaptive control or uh, prediction. Okay, and we can show that actually you can do this very very easily. Okay, uh, you can basically uh, you know um, uh, have uh, adaptation laws. Uh, yeah, sorry, have uh, basically a, an observer-like system. Uh, for the position and momentum and an adaptation law. And this will globally converge with P hat tending to P and Q hat tending to P, no matter what the trajectory is. Okay. Uh, and that gives you again, uh, basically a contraction. This is based again on the contraction condition. Okay. Uh, so this contra the contraction condition is that this is a uh, negative definite uh, in the general case, which is always true for large enough KP and KQ. The, the, the observer gains, but in the special case, which for instance, Batu considers of uh, separable Hamiltonians, then you get a very simple condition uh, for this predictor plus uh, predictor plus um, adaptation to work. So now an example, so for instance, if you take, uh, you know, three, uh, point, uh, three point masses, uh, interacting uh, directly with um, uh, three, three point masses uh, interacting. Uh, so that's the actual Hamiltonian. And you're not, but you don't know the actual Hamiltonian. So you pick basis functions, which are squares and the fourth powers of, uh, of PI and QI. Okay, that should be PI and QI. Uh, and uh, also uh, potentials, but you don't know whether the potential is one over R, one over R square, and so on. Okay, so uh, so you know all these potential in Q one minus Q two and so on. You you pick them all in R square and R cube. Okay, so you have a you have a big set of uh, of basis functions, and you use a, a sparsity promoting predictor, namely an L one plus epsilon predictor, uh, to to learn a parsimonious Hamiltonian. Okay. And without uh, getting into the details, okay, so this is what happens, okay, so this is the error of prediction, okay, so basically you run this system, uh, and at time t equal 10, you switch off the measurement, so you just run the simulation open loop, and you see it does very well, okay, uh, you know, you could compute actually contraction rate of the, uh, of the resulting system, but you see it does extremely well. Uh, so this is when you switch off the, the, the learning after 10 and you just run the prediction for this three-body problem. Of course, if you don't do adaptation, you don't expect it to work well. Uh, and this, it doesn't, okay? Uh, so uh, basically you get much larger error even uh, when you have uh, measurements, but then all hell, well, basically uh, you get the, uh, the, you know, total mess after that, because basically the, the no adaptation case tends incorrectly to a fixed point. Okay. So you can see that very clearly after 10, here you have the prediction error from the adaptive case, and here you have prediction error without adaptation, and, I, and uh, there's no need for a picture. Similarly, if you have uh, adaptive control with primitives, where you sum up your primitives to one, okay, a natural cost function is the relative entropy, Okay, uh, because you these uh, play with like uh, probability functions, uh, and so uh, if uh, if you do that, uh, suppose you have a, a trajectory that uh, randomly switches uh, between desired trajectory every two hundred units of time. Okay, then um, what happens is that. Uh, 
uh, if you adaptive control is nice and stable in both cases, but if you use a Euclidean, uh, if you use a, a Euclidean kind of uh, potential, you know, just the usual uh, L2, then you get these kinds of errors in green in all, on the logarithmic scale. While if you use uh, this uh, entropy-based uh, um, implicit regularization, then you get on this logarithmic scale these blue errors. Okay, so you see the huge uh, difference, and you also see that uh, these um, these implicit regularization basically switch at the right times to basically pick the most relevant basic function. It picks some of the others too, but. Uh, it's much more uh, discerning, if you want, than picking the relative basis functions as you switch around time. Uh, along the line also of, uh, for instance, the paper by Brunton and his colleagues in, uh, in PNES, uh, you can do this uh, for uh, directly on forces, okay? For instance, if you take a mass action kinetics uh, and a chemical reaction network, okay? And suppose you just say, well, you know, I just, I just don't know these equations. You know, they, I just know they're polynomials, okay? Uh, I just know they are monomials, uh, combinations of monomials. And uh, I don't know what, uh, what really reacts with what, okay? So I'm going to pick up all monomials up to the total degree three, which means I have a, a, a total uh, of 140 uh, basis functions, okay? Uh, but then I'm going to do sparse adaptation, okay? And if I do that, uh, then you can see that indeed you're going to learn extremely, uh, most of the parameters are going to be zero. It's going to be just a few which are non-zero, okay? Uh, so basically you're going to pick at least given the data you have available, which may not may or not be rich enough to completely identify the system. Uh, you're going to pick a very sparse set of basis functions instead of the whole thing. Uh, and so, in a sense, you're doing both in the Hamiltonian case and in the uh, in the primitives case, and in this case, you're doing model discovery at the same time as you're doing learning. So, uh, last point on this: this is work with uh, Nicholas Buffy and Stephen too, uh, is that uh, as uh, as you know, uh, well. So we've been trying to bridge all of these tools, which are contraction plus adaptation and uh, uh, using some ideas, fundamental ideas from adaptive nonlinear control with the current machine learning algorithms for control, okay? And these current machine learning algorithms for control are based on the notion of regret, okay? So, uh, so, Again, all these papers are 2020, and uh, this one is just uh, just on archive. Okay. So basically, typically adaptive control is done in continuous time, and you're trying to get x to 10 towards the desired trajectory. Same thing for prediction. Uh, reinforcement learning is typically more con considered a discrete time system and regret bounds. Okay, so systems like this. Okay, the the time step doesn't have to be constant, but systems like this. Okay, uh, and regret bound, and you know some some stochastic term wt. And so the regret bound uh, we define as uh, the expected value over this uh, bounded wt of the sum between t equals zero and t minus one of the difference between the output of the adaptive algorithm and the output that an oracle would have. In other words, what the output that uh, the system uh, would have if you know the parameters exactly. And this is because we we having this, this stochastic term, right? So this may not be perfect either, uh, but at least it's based on the exact parameters, okay? And what you play, of course, is the certainly equivalence controller U of X T uh, equals uh, Y A hat. So this is the regret, okay? So now what, what happens is this, you do things this way, then you can start doing adaptive control uh, using an even broader class of uh, parameter estimation techniques, okay? Uh, and in particular, uh, actually it's very close in spirit to what used to be called an indirect adaptive control, um, uh, direct uh, using, uh, using in this uh, algorithms from online convex optimization. So 
if suppose you're trying to minimize the function approximation error here, okay, which contains also uh, this noise term, then you, you're going to apply a discrete gradient update at time t plus one. And the key remark here is because this update is applied at t, time t plus one, okay, you can use xt plus one. Okay. So because of that, in a perfectly causal way. So uh, because of that, for those of you who know about this, you know, in co the continuous version of this involves uh, the application to in adaptive control of uh, the, the idea used in Lewinberger reduced order observer, the, the idea of getting a free time derivative. Uh, but, you know, in, in continuous time, uh, it involves solving a PDE in general. So it's quite complex to implement. Well, discrete time is very, very easy because you can do this okay, in a perfectly causal way. And similarly, you can you can do online Newton in in a similar um, in a similar way. So you, you can have these kind of new algorithms if you want. So what's the the basic uh, outline of proof? I don't have much time to get into this, but suppose you start with a contracting system. Okay, uh, then this system for a given sequence W T noise sequence W T will be contracting for small enough noise. Okay, and you're going to compare this with what the oracle would do. So the control regret, okay, is always less than some constant times square root of t times the prediction regret, okay. So that's uh, that's what is shown uh, in in this paper, okay. And also then, once you have this prediction regret, you can explicitly bound it using bounds derived by all the people I've mentioned before, okay, in online convex optimization. So basically, you can have this less than, less than c square root of t uh, times uh, times uh, two times this, okay, and which is the bound provided by online convex optimization. And so it says if you apply gradient descent with a decaying step size uh, in one over square root of t plus one, then the control regret bound will vary as uh, will uh, vary uh, uh, um, sublinearly as uh, O of t to the power three fourth. Well, if you apply Newton, uh, online Newton with a constant step size, then you'll have an even better uh, result, which will be square root of t log of one plus t. So, and you know, you, you can, uh, you can, uh, uh, Nick and Stephen de derive the examples in the paper for that. Um, so that's, so basically, you know, so we, we have this, uh, th this result, you know, where we have these explicit regret bounds for, uh, adaptive algorithms, both classical algorithm, new adapt, uh, new algorithm. And this kind of allows to, uh, to build a bridge if you want between, uh, between these, um, uh, recent results in reinforcement learning and so on, and these recent results inspired by adaptive control. Uh, and uh, and contraction. Notice also uh, uh, forgot the important point, right? Which is that when when we look at this, okay, first of all, it's directly in the nonlinear case. We don't linearize anything, okay. So this is directly in the nonlinear case. Um, uh, and also, it's directly in the time dependent case, okay. So in other words, we're not just concerned about set points, we can do uh, trajectories without any problem. Okay, so uh, it's, it's automatically done uh, in, this, uh, in this context. So last point, uh, transfer learning. Okay, so this idea of, you know, you have learned uh, a controller, or a nominal controller, uh, you know, using a lot of work, whether experimentally or in uh, simulations and so on. And now you would like to say, well, wait a minute, the parameters have changed and so on. So if there are structure changes in what I'm doing. Uh, how can, what should I do? Okay. And so I don't have time to, to go through this, but there's a whole uh, series of papers around the theme of control contraction metric. Okay. Uh, so we, we wrote this paper with Ian Manchester and his group did more work on, on this. Uh, uh, and uh, Sumit Singh, uh, you know, did more work on uh, applying this to uh, motion planning, and in particular to the notion of using contraction as a regularizer. Okay, so in other words, saying if you learn a system for control, you should 
you could impose contraction properties as a way to regularize the system to get better data efficiency. Because after all, if you're learning your closed loop system, you'd better assume it's contracting. So you might as well put that in there as well. Okay, And that's only a first set of papers that's, uh, that's going, well, it's pr presumably going to be uh, more papers from that group uh, in that direction. Uh, here I asked Tsukamoto and Sujo Chong, you know, said, well, you know, what, what about using uh, networks to, uh, to learn the metrics, okay? And that's also an idea which is explored uh, in, in another group uh, from Caltech now at, uh, now at MIT. It's a very uh, interesting idea of just using the network to learn the metrics, okay? And the, this paper, Learning Certificates from Data, uh, again with, uh, with Nick, uh, Nick Bofi and Stephen Tu, uh, it says, well, you know, suppose you have your system uh, it was designed somehow, it kind of works nominally. How can you find a contraction metric to describe it? Okay, because once you have that, you can start doing adaptation. So, uh, and that's the, 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 the spirit, uh, you know, this, this was in the spirit of this paper, you know, uh, you have a nominal closed loop contracting system and uh, you want to do uh, transfer learning or sim to real, right? You, you have, uh, you know, from, from the simulation to the real thing, you have more friction, you have things that change, the parameters were not quite right and so on. Okay. And so uh, we have, the, we have this, uh, this paper with, uh, with Brett Lopez, you know, we, which shows, you know, starting a system like this, where the nominal system is contracting, okay? Uh, where, uh, you know, uh, you, you have the metric which describes the closed loop nominal system, then what's the, uh, adapt what's the version of all these adaptive controllers and so on when uh, you have a, a metric okay, in, in your nominal system. And remember when I, I talked about the result of Nick Buffy and so on, I said this were for a constant metric, but you can use them for a general metric uh, using these tools. And, and the idea is, uh, is actually quite simple, basically, uh, instead of uh, picking the uh, quite natural once you've said it right, uh, which is uh, instead of picking the usual quadratic form in, in, in error, you pick the Riemannian energy corresponding to the quadratic form in the Lyapunov the function. So remember, uh, you know, uh, we, we spent a lot of time uh, changing the second part of the Lyapunov functions and replacing it with Bregman divergence. You can change the first part to, to make it uh, applicable to many more general metrics. And so I'll, I'll uh, probably uh, stop this. So we talked about basic contractual analysis. We talked about how you can replace uh, uh, intuitive ideas about gradient and convexity by just as intuitive, but much more general ideas about uh, gradient and contraction. Uh, we showed how you could apply this to uh, adaptive prediction, where you learn a system and then you run, you let the simulation run open loop, okay? Uh, always stably. Uh, how can you use implicit regularization, in particular L1 regularization, uh, to, for sparsity and, and model discovery? Uh, we showed how you can uh, express all these adaptive controllers and some new ones in terms of regrets, which should allow to uh, compare more easily with work by Hasibi and his group, Hazan and his group, and so on. Uh, which were presented in the in the previous um, in the previous lectures in this series. Uh, this um, applies directly to nominal nonlinear systems and nominal non-autonomous nonlinear systems, time-varying nonlinear systems, so you can play with trajectory tracking. Uh, basic uh, papers on uh, contraction can be found here, and uh, all the rest of the talk is based on 2020 papers, uh, which can all be found on archive, and some of which have been published in uh, neural computation and, uh, and PLOS. So I'll probably stop here for questions. Thank you so much for the great talk. Uh, if you if you want, you can uh, unmute yourself and directly interact with John Jack. Before that, I'm gonna refer some questions from chat box first. Uh, in general, how how to choose the metrics in contraction analysis? Do we have some like fundamental principles to do that? Yeah, yeah, very good question. So, uh, so for, first of all, uh, you have the combination properties. Okay, so the combination properties say that. Uh, the combination properties say that uh, if you have sub-blocks coming with their metrics, then you can combine them using parallel combination, feedback combinations, and so on, using simple rules. And you're going to build progressively a very large contracting system, 
And the metric will automatically come from these very simple metrics from the subblocks. Okay? So that's one, one way, okay? but basically just these aggregation properties, okay? building contracting system in an evolution-like way or building them recursively. Okay? And, and again, I think there's a lot of work to do uh, in the context of machine learning to uh, put several blocks together, you know, several, several uh, deep learners and so on. Uh, two, you can of course use physics, okay? So for instance, just as, uh, you know, using, uh, for those of you who know that the uh, error transpose, inertia matrix, error transpose in adaptive robot control, okay? So you have the inertia matrix in there of the robot, okay? You can use the inertia matrix for a mechanical system, you know, to to derive contraction properties. Okay, so that's something uh, uh, that we have done. Actually, we, we've done uh, before. We've uh, years ago, uh, we uh, you know we did wrote an expensive paper uh, using this with Sunjo Chang. Uh, so you 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 can build uh, you can uh, use um, on contraction analysis Hamiltonian systems. You can use physical properties to uh, to build uh, these metrics. And then, of course, uh, and I just mentioned that briefly, you can try to do it numerically. Okay? And doing it numerically was exactly what this slide was about. Okay? It's saying, well, you know, so if it's not a combination of system that you built recursively, and if you don't have any idea of the physics and so on, you can always try to do it numerically, or you can try to do it numerically for the part of, more importantly, you can try to numerically for the part of the system where you don't have uh, good physical knowledge. Uh, and that's what these control contraction metrics uh, tools uh, are and uh, their, uh, their later uh, applications. Thanks. So uh, sorry, I, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention this question is from Zahara. Uh, and the next question from Jixin from Caltech is, is is contraction analysis related to neuroscience? Can we have some insights from neuroscience? For example, our brain has has some uh, internal uh, uh, estimator to do the adaptive uh, prediction, something like that. Okay, so so I have a student in neuroscience working exactly on this, right? But we've we've written a, a couple of uh, of papers in that direction. Uh, but what what we know is, you know, contraction is a form of stability and. And stability is, is kind of a basic requirement for anything to work, right? Uh, so, but also we know that in neuroscience and more generally in biology, you're going to have lots of combinations of subsystems as a result of evolution, but also practically, if I may say, as a result of development okay, of the organism. Uh, and so uh, the, the idea is that uh, beyond some scale, you know, uh, contraction properties are going to be uh, very uh, natural way to see things. Uh, we've written a number of papers in that direction, and actually, we, we have uh, uh, we have one or two one, one paper which just came out uh, in uh, PLOS computational biology, specifically looking at uh, neural data. Thanks. Uh, would you like to take two more questions? I know it's yeah. Like, uh, I have plenty of time. I know I ran a little over. I'll have as much time as you want. So. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, uh, let, let's have a, a three more question. Uh, one is from Omar. Uh, how far is adaptive prediction from a model uh, MPC? Uh, I think it's going to be very different because you know, I mean, one of the key things in all of this is that we have global convergence proofs for nonlinear systems. So. Uh, MPC is very nice. It's a nice idea. It makes a lot of sense and so on. Uh, but uh, there's almost no proof for nonlinear systems, uh, you know, beyond some very simple results. Okay. So here we, we, we're trying to have uh, you know, global results. But, you know, the, the point is that uh, these algorithms, uh, because they come with their convergence proof and robustness proof and so on, should be much, much more effective, you know, uh, uh, personally, uh, I, I used to do a lot of work in, in adaptive robot control. You know, there was some adaptive robot controller uh, before, you know, uh, the of based adaptive robot controller, but they work very, very, very poorly. And you got, you know, orders of magnitude improvement by having a convergence proof because the convergence proof generated an exact algorithm. Okay. So, uh, so I think, uh, you know, uh, MPC is very interesting. It makes a lot of sense and so on. Uh, but uh, I suspect these techniques are going to uh, to be uh, more uh, more directly powerful. And of course, you can do you can try to combine them with MPC. Actually, that's some of the work we're doing with Brett Lopez now. Actually. Thanks. Uh, question from Rodolfo. 
uh, have you studied the geometric uh, geometric inside of systems that learn the Hamiltonian functions uh, considering the dynamics of the Hamiltonian function? Uh, yeah, well, you know, so I'm not sure if that's exactly the question, but uh, what, what you do get though is uh, because you have this, uh, this, um, this is, you know, uh, estimating momentum and estimating position, you, you see that you respect the symplectic structure, right, of the Hamiltonian problem. Okay, so uh, that's, uh, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but yeah, basically, you, so that, but, but of course, yeah, the idea here is to say, rather than estimating the forces, if you have a Hamiltonian system, estimate the Hamiltonian, right? which is a much more economical way to do things, the scalar, right? And uh, so- uh, Thanks. Yeah, uh, let's have the last question from Kai Qing from UIOC. Uh, uh, I'm wondering uh, the relationship between uh, natural adaptation law uh, and L1 impl implicit regularization. Uh, oh, okay, so maybe I could explain that a little better. Okay, so uh, so this is the natural adaptation law, right? Well, okay, so this is a natural adaptation law, right? So it's basically the usual thing, but then instead of having just a constant P matrix, you have this Hessian, this inverse Hessian of this potential, and typically the potential is a norm, right? Uh, so what we show is, so, so this, first of all, uh, X hat converges to uh, X desired and, and, and so on. So this, this has a, you know, uh, it, it has convergence properties that you can guarantee it had, uh, everything is bounded and X hat converges to X. What the theorem shows is that if you do that, then if you are over parameterized, either because you're minimally parameterized, but the trajectory, the desired trajectory is extremely boring. So there's many sets of parameters which will achieve it, or you're aggressively parameterized as in deep learning, then what this uh, natural adaptation law will do will out of all the things that fit the dynamics out of the set of interpolating parameters, it will pick the one which minimize your particular potential. So for instance, your particular norm, okay? And that's a theorem, okay? Uh, that's a theorem, and that's uh, you know the the, the proof of this uh, is that uh, basically you you look at the Bregman derivative and you integrate it, okay, and then you optimize uh, over those sides. Okay, so that so that so, so that's the theorem. And then you know uh, we, we've played a lot with L one optimization. They they may be other re, other kinds of potentials for us, for instance in the uh, in the motion primitives we played with entropy and so on. Okay, but that's a theorem, right? That's basically in the overparameterized case when the solution alpha is not unique then it will tend toward the minimum, the solution that interpolates and minimizes the potential. All right, uh, thank you so much, John Jack, for this great talk. Yeah, and thank thanks much, everyone thank for uh, yeah, attending this talk. Thank you thanks. very much for inviting me, it was fun. Uh, excuse me. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, hi, can I ask a question? Sure. Well, sure. Uh, I was wondering, can uh, can we use contraction for set invariance for proving uh, that tra trajectories of the system won't leave a specified set? Uh, well, you could use it with set. Well, okay, yes, actually, you can, but it, that would take us a little far. Uh, what you what you can show is that you can take the contraction condition and add to it. Uh, which has to do with, uh, in the L2 case, the, in the uh, two norm case, which has to do with uh, eigenvalues of, uh, of uh, generalized Jacobian. And you can add to it a gamma dot term where gamma dot is the derivative of some scalar function, which is just bounded. And the system will still verify contraction condition is that, if that is true. You can use this function gamma dot to basically make sure that you converge to some set after which it's going to become invariant. Okay, so this is my kind of generalization of contraction. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Okay, thank you.